Good day once again, this is Dr. Ariel and we're going to discuss the part 2 of our nervous system lecture. I hope that you watch the first one first, the first part before this because it will be very confusing, especially with the new terms that you'll learn. Now for some who had their lecture about this during their grade school, uh, that's best. That's a good thing because you can have, this will be just a review for you. I if you also notice, there's a lot of things that we need to discuss regarding the different topics, regarding the different systems. But I choose the ones that you need to learn for this level, okay? Later, you'll read a lot soon, okay? So, uh, also, I hope, you, I hope you've watched the, the video regarding the COVID-19 vaccine so that you will be enlightened regarding your choices or your plans whether to receive the vaccine or not if ever that the vaccine becomes available in the market or actually as of what i know the main goal of our government is to vaccinate all the filipinos here in in our area no every everybody should be vaccinated but unfortunately because there's minimal or the small uh, problem regarding the the supply and same as with the budget so they prioritize the frontliners first then I don't know how they prioritize things, right? So uh, maybe anyway, later, maybe we could all be vaccinated, okay? I just hope that Sinovac is also as effective as they claim it to be, okay? Because I'm one of the individuals who received that with the picture on you know, the V-Sign. Uh, now let's start. Let's start our lecture, the second part with the cerebellum, the one highlighted. Okay, the, the colored one, if you notice. The cerebellum contains half of the neurons of the brain, despite of its size. Now, just like the cerebrum, the cerebellum has folded surfaces or surface that increases the surface area of its outer gray matter cortex. If you remember my discussion about the fingerprints, the one that we talk about during the integumentary system, I placed a picture with a straight road and the one is the curvy one, the, the zigzag one. So uh, remember when I told you from point A to point B, if it's only a straight line, it will only take maybe around one or two kilometers. But then the other one, if it's curvy, the road is curvy, it will be maybe around three to four. So meaning the only thing that I want to highlight regarding that discussion is the, the more curves there is or what we call folds, the, the surface area tends to become wider or longer. So in this case, because the cerebellum contains a lot of folds, meaning there's a greater number of neurons that could be placed in its cor cortex. Okay, I hope that's clear. Uh, we The next part, the next um, slides will be talking about the different, different things that we need to learn first in correlation with the brain. Just like for example, the fissures or the 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 groove the deep groove between the cerebellum and the cerebrum as you i hope you know which one is the cerebrum the big one the gloves like the glove like one and the cerebrum the one we highlighted earlier the groove between that is what we call or the the fissure let's just do the use the term fissure that's what we call that transverse fissure okay and inside that, or or there are some cavities no, inside that, like the one highlighted, it's the fox, I don't know if it's pronounced well, fox cerebelli, that is a small sickle-shaped fold of the dura mater. So it's a part of the dura mater projecting towards into the posterior cerebellar notch. I, I hope you know what the notch is, as well as projecting into the Valicula, it's I won't we won't be talking about valicula anyway of the cerebellum between two cerebellar hemispheres. So later we'll talk about the hemispheres and that's the thing that that the fox the I think it's pronounced as fox. I forgot the the one placed on our textbook. No, it's fox cerebelli. So that's the one between the two cerebellar hemisphere. It actually covers the top of the cerebellum and supports the somehow no, but uh, I mean the, the the layers no for for better separation. 
So the next one is the Tentorium Cerebelli. It is actually a horizontal, the one, the one with the arrow. No, it's a horizontal cavity, still part of the dura mater, like a part of the dura mater. It covers the top of the cerebellum and supports the occipital lobe of the cerebrum uh, later in the brain. So this actually helps in the separation of these different parts of the brain or, or the central nervous system and for soon if ever that uh, it, during the the medical part no it actually helps in the separation for to avoid crossing of infection or it supports that area to avoid if ever there uh, avoid uh, inclusion of other other parts if there are traumas bleeding or so uh, but later you'll learn more about that okay I, i'm just trying to give you an idea regarding the significance of such parts so the primary function of the cerebellum is to evaluate how well movements initiate by motor areas in the cerebrum are actually being carried out as mentioned by our textbook when movements initiated by the cerebellar or the cerebral motor areas are not being carried out correctly, the cerebellum detects the discrepancies. So it's like, uh, I don't, it was not highlighted in the textbook, but it's like a corrector. No, it's it's checking the the function of the other uh, the other parts of the brain, specifically the cerebrum. So it also it. It then sends feedbacks and correct it and uh, regarding the cerebral cortex via its the connections to the its connections to the thalamus. Then the feedback signal helps the to correct errors and then smoothens the movement and coordinates the complex sequences of the skeletal muscles and contraction. So that's why if you have problems with the cerebellum, that's one later we'll talk about ataxia, no? uh, the the this coordination of our movement. Also, the cerebellum is the main brain region that regulates posture and balance. When we talk about the system, when we talk about the balance, no, regarding balance, uh, the, there are a lot of factors that we need to consider, but uh, one of the, the system as well, or should I say special senses that is important for the balance is the vestibulocochlear area. I think you remember the nerves, uh, the, the cranial nerves that we we talk about. So that's one of the important part of the balance. Soon we'll talk about that, or maybe during the fourth level, if ever, if whoever your teacher would be during the fourth year. So that's also important, including the cerebellum. Okay. So again, cerebellum for regulation of posture and balance. Okay. I hope that's clear. So maybe uh, the things that I could ask me, I'm not sure I haven't created the exam yet or quiz. I may ask if ever you have problems regarding the posture or in balance, what part of the brain or CNS is affected or may have some lesions or problems. Maybe I'll do it that way. So as I mentioned, the ataxia, no? This is an example, uh, like, there are some ways now we can we can check the the function of the cerebellum. Let's just for example, if a blinded blindfolded person with ataxia cannot actually touch the tip of their nose with a finger because they cannot coordinate movements with their sense or with where the body part is. So you need to uh you don't have that part but no i'm actually making an action right now on how to do it but anyway another sign of ataxia is the changed speech pattern due to the uncoordinated speech muscle uh, including the because the cerebellar damage may also result in the staggering or abnormal walking movements and everything diba? because we recall remember cerebellar uh, damage may have some problems with the coordination Okay, also people people who consumes too much alcohol, you notice if you take too much alcohol, we may show ataxia because of the alcohol inhibits the activity of the cerebellum. So that's why the picture shows that if ever you're al alcoholic. No, so nice to know. These are nice to know. But actually, I, will, I could include this for our quiz. And then also for those who have problems like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease 
Atakshe is also a part of the manifestation, but it's more on the degenerative side. No, it's because of the degen- degeneration. Also, people who have trauma, uh, brain tumor, genetic factors, and side effects of some medications. This, what we call ataxia, could be one of the manifestations. Okay, uh, it's not only for the movement, but as you can see in the picture, no, there are slurred speech. There are also some heart problems, and then the of trouble eating and swallowing because there's no coordination i don't know if you could recall there is a cor- the the swallowing should be coordinated from the time that you swallow it and the food is passed from one area to another everything should be coordinated because if it's not there are it could be a trap no <laughs> or place somewhere else anyway let's move forward the uh, this is a picture of the, uh, it's the posterior view and the, it's the, I uh, know it's not the posterior, it's the superior view and then the inferior view, not a label, I, I didn't notice because, uh, but anyway, that's the thing, there's an arrow as well on how you, you perceive. So the superior, or remember superior is top and inferior is bottom, the, these views, the shape of the cerebellum resembles like a butterfly so there's a worm the one the worm part then the wings so the the vermis the one i placed the label the red one is actually the warm part of the butterfly no uh the cerebral the cerebellar hemisphere is i don't know if i place a mark no i didn't place a mark the cerebral hem- hemisphere is the wings, and each hemisphere consists of lobes separated by fissures. Okay, that's the anterior one, the anterior lobe, and then the posterior lobe. And there is also what we call the flocol, floc- uh, sorry, flocolonodular lobe, which is on the right picture. Okay. And this flocculonodular lobe is on the inferior surface that contributes the equilibrium the, to equilibrium and balance as well. The cerebral cortex is actually the superficial layer of the cerebellum, as indicated, the one with the mark, the gray matter. Okay, and then the gray matter in a series of sl- is a is actually in a series of slender and parallel folds found in the cerebellar cortex is called it's what we call the folia okay then the white matter is called the vitae i'm not sure if i didn't label it okay so that's the vitae but these are not really that significant to remember for now but for your laboratory you need to memorize this for those who have laboratory subjects there are the the three paired cerebellar peduncle the peduncle is this one the one that i i indicated i highlighted uh, that attaches the cerebellum are quite important for the connection uh, this picture is another way for you to rem- to notice no which one is the peduncle the peduncle this the, the right picture is actually cut then I placed another picture for you to to know which uh, what what is a peduncle, no? Because before when I was uh, younger, no, when I was having my first year uh, nursing, I'm very confused. Why is the peduncle like this? That they only show the picture, the one on the just like the one on the left side. So it's very confusing for us to to correlate why what's the peduncle but anyway these bundles of white matter consist of axons that conduct impulses between the cerebellum and other parts of the brain so it's a connection towards the cerebellum the, the there are three cerebellar or the cerebellum uh, i mean cere- cere- cerebellar peduncles the superior the middle and the inferior cerebellar peduncles so the superior cerebellar peduncles contains axons or contain 
actually it's pedunculs, forgive me, I didn't place the S. It contains axons that extend from the cerebellum to the red nuclei of the midbrain. Remember the red nuclei that we talked about during the first part? And to several nuclei of the thalamus. The middle cerebellar peduncle are the largest peduncle or peduncles. Their axons carry impulses or carry impulses, forgive me for the grammar, impulses for the voluntary movement from the pontine nuclei. I hope you recall that as well, but I didn't really focus on that. Into the cerebellum, which actually receives in input from motor areas of the cerebellar cortex. Okay, then... The inferior cerebellar peduncle consists of five. So the first one is the axons of the spinocerebellar tract. So when we say, remember, take note of this, no, so that you won't be confused. When we say spinocerebellar tract, it came from the spine, then it goes to the cerebellar area. So that's the tract. That's how they named the tract. That carries, it actually carries sensory information into the cerebellum from the proprioceptors in the trunk and leaf, uh, limb. Sorry. Uh, the, you may ask, what is proprioceptors? Actually, proprioception, it's, it's uh, defined as, or it refers to the body's ability to perceive its own position in space. So if ever that you're lying down, you should know that you're lying down. Or if you're sitting, you should know that you're sitting. So meaning, there are some disorders I hope you don't have one, no? But anyway, there are some disorders with these issues. If you have lesions, cancer, or any mass on that specific parts, so it may you may have some problems with that, okay? The second one, actually there's five, no? But the, this is the second one, the accents from the vestibular apparatus of the inner ear and from the vestibulo or vestibular nuclei of the medulla and pons. It carries the sensory information into the cerebellum from the proprioceptors in the head. Okay, earlier, it's more on the trunk and limbs. Then the second one is from the head. Still, you know that what proprioception is, right? Then the third one is the axons from the inferior olivary nucle nucleus of the medulla or medulla, forgive me, that enter the, cerebe the cerebellum and regulates the activity of the cerebellar neurons. And then the fourth one is the axons that extends from the cerebellum to the vestibular nuclei of the medulla and pons. And finally, the fifth one is the axons that extends from the cerebellum to the reticular formation. I think you don't need to memorize this, but I, I just include this because they told me that uh, my performance is somehow calculated with the knowledge that you learned or uh, I don't know, no, with the, the way I, they didn't actually give me the, the school or the Veles College didn't give me a curriculum or, or how do you call that? The syllabus. So I just made my syllabus according to how I think you should be learning. So I, I wish to teach everything, but there's no much time. No, I, I think if they will ask me how many SEMs do I need, I think I, I need at least two SEMs for you, me to tell you everything that you need to know about the human anatomy and physiology. So let's continue. Now we're done with the cerebellum. Let's talk about the diencephalon. The diencephalon forms a central core of brain tissue just superior to the midbrain. So there are three, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The one with the mark, the green mark, in front of you is the diencephalon. So I hope that's clear. I hope the picture is clear. So the diencephalon contains numerous nuclei involved in a wide variety of sensory and motor processing between higher and lower brain centers. So let's talk about the thalamus. The thalamus, which measures about 3 cm or 1.2 inches in length and makes up at up to 80% of the diencephalon, consists of paired oval masses of the gray matter organized into nuclei with interspersed tract of the white matter. Actually, it's a definition from our textbook. So as you can see, the, the one with the highlight, no, that's the 
thalamus. I won't be so particular with the different parts of the thalamus, but you can read that for future use, <laughs> but I won't discuss that much. So the thalamus is the major relay station for most sensory impulses that reach the primary sensory area. I know you'll be asking, what is the primary sensory area? It is more on the cerebrum. Later, we'll be discussing that on the latter part, on the last part. Uh, of the cerebral cortex okay so remember that later you can correlate this and then it's like connecting the dots later so it again it's actually more in the sensory area uh, the primary sensory area from the spinal cord and the brain stem the thalamus contributes to the motor functions by transmitting information from the cerebellum to the primary motor area of the cerebral cortex Okay, and uh, it plays a role in maintaining the consciousness as well. So you should remember that. So there are levels of consciousness. The first one, this is not included in textbook or in our notes. Actually, I tried searching more informi uh, examples, but it's not really that clear. No? So there is what we call the alert and then the lethargic, obtunded, stupor or stuporous and coma or comatose so the alert it actually the appearance of wakefulness also it has an awareness of self and environment so there are, there are what we call uh, if soon you'll be having writing the chart no for progress notes of your patients you should write if if the patient is awake alert oriented to time place a uh, date and a person so if ever that they don't, they're not oriented, they're awake, they're, but they don't know, like I had a patient a week ago, no, the, we asked, the, the patient is okay, everything is okay, and then he, he can walk, he can talk, he eats, he, he, he's very much normal, but when I asked him, what's the name of the person beside you, which is actually uh, his wife, no? Uh, he can't remember and then he tried to shift the topic uh, it's like this I talk about something else and then I asked him do you know where you are and then he said he mentioned that uh, actually my head is aching I'm not sure you, you may think these people know or this this patient to be crazy or they don't want to talk about something else but in that case no that's why I asked we together with my partner no we not, not that not the love partner okay my partner during the duty that time because actually we're paired no so we decided to admit the patient send the patient for a ct scan or cat scan for for foreigners no so uh we 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 finally figure out that the patient is actually having a stroke so uh he he have he had no he had a stroke that's why these specific parts, not actually these parts, no, but I, uh, there are parts of his brain which is affected. That's why he's confused. He's still alert or awake, even awake, but confused. He's not oriented with the time, place, and date, and also uh, it's actually time and date is the same. And, uh, and the person, okay? So... Uh, that's the thing about alert. Now, let's talk about lethargic. I can't find any other pictures, so I choose this. <laughs> so, if we say, when we say lethargic, there is a mild reduction of alertness. Uh, drowsy, but can be aroused. Okay? So, but you need gentle verbal or touch stimulation to initiate response. So, you should say, hey, sir, are you okay? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Or, or maybe you can tap, hey, uh, sir, are you okay? Are you sleepy? Yeah, I'm sleepy, but uh, like this and like that. So you can ask a again question, interview the patient. So that's what we call lith lethargic or lethargy. So in some case, you no, know, during the time that I, I was having my uh, lectures or reviews, uh, when I was a student, I, I really feel drowsy most of the time. So I consider myself most of the time lethargic. No, I'm a knockdown good. Also, another part of the levels of consciousness is the obtunded. 
So there is a moderate reduction of alertness. It's very easy if the question is only mild, moderate, or severe. But actually, these patients are difficult to arouse and respond slowly to external stimulus to maintain attention and response. So, uh, and it, they cannot make a complete sentence. It requires repeated stimulation. If ever, man, you need to stimulate the patient again and again for them to respond again. Like, for example, I, I don't know, no? It's, bet, it's best on time if you could... I could give you some role-playing assignment, no? By pair, <laughs> COVID-19, no? But anyway, you can you can portray how these things work. I, I hope it's possible, no? I, I, I know a few of you will disagree, but I think it's it's fun to to have such activities. Tell me lang, I'll, I'll ask your president if it's, if you, you could portray this. Maybe by, not by pair, no? One person is one, uh, later na, let's talk about that. For us to have extra points to make sure that everybody pass. <laughs> or every, everybody passes, no? Is that the right term? Uh, going back, so this patient, if ever you, you, you stimulate the patient, hey sir, yeah, yes, yes, and what happened to you? Uh, we were walking uh, and then go back or goes back to sleep or unconscious or so and then you need to stimulate again and then we'll wake up. So those are the terms, no? Just a recall, it's actually given and it's moderate reduction of alertness. But how you can you can how can you define that? It's difficult to arouse in some point and then there's a slow response and you cannot, the patient cannot make a complete sentence and you need to repeat repeatedly uh, stimulate the patient again and again for you to ask for more data or other to ask questions again and again okay so that's the obtunded another is too poor for us for some sources they call it deep sleep or the patient is asleep or deep sleep they can be aroused only by vigorous and repeated or repeated uh, stimulation so vigorous meaning there's pain usually we stimulate the patient on the chest area no i don't know if you've been watching mga uh, online uh, series like how they stimulate the patient that's actually that's actually how we do it and then the response is usually non-verbal they just moan like uh, uh, for patients or uh, for individuals who are completely intoxicated no, with alcohol that's more, most of them are stupors. So they just moan. You don't understand. But actually the patient is answering you. In their brains, they are like answering you completely. No, But on, on how we understand it, it's like we don't understand anything. So that's actually stupor. So this uh, also has a, a later, later I'll share as we, we talk about all the things so well in the on the other hand coma there's no evidence of awareness the patient's not really aware and there's no evidence of response despite of the painful stimulus even if you kick the patient you will not really uh, no uh, no no response at all no the patient won't kick back so why am I sharing this because if ever you will be asked as you uh, if ever you're you're even if you're just a bystander, no, or maybe if you're, if you're just someone on the crime scene, a crime scene or an accident scene, at least you can, you can inform the paramedics regarding the condition of the patient even via call. So you can say that the patient is in, uh, maybe stupor, uh, stuporous, maybe obtunded or so. But the problem is, what if the other side, no, the paramedics, forgot about this? That's another problem. It's, it's not our problem anymore. So I also include an easier way for you to remember. No, it, and Actually, this is from a site about nursing reviews. So they have different and funnier pictures. No, So for full consciousness, awake, alert, and ready to party, <laughs> that's the thing. Confusion, they include this as a different different uh, category. It progressive disorientation, forgets stuff, difficult to follow commands, restless or agitated. For lethargy, sorry, I should go back. For lethargy, they are oriented to person, place, and time. Oh, that's the PPT that you need to remember. I always add the date, but it's not really included. The date is like the time. 
You don't need to ask the patient, what time is it? Uh, you can't remember, no. Do you think it's 3 p.m.? Or 3 a.m.? Or do you think it's... No, you don't need to be very specific. You just ask the person, what date is today? Or is it a Thursday? Uh, some mistakes, sometimes if we, call, we ask the patient very complex question, expect a wrong answer, okay? Maybe we'll tell the, pa- the doctor, no, the, the patient is not oriented as well. He, he, you ask him, what's my name? <laughs> For example, you have a patient, what's my name? My complete name, what's my middle initial? Obviously, the patient doesn't know you, so expect a wrong answer. Maybe, maybe you're a doctor, maybe the patient will answer that way. So don't be very meticulous with this part, okay? Also, uh, under the lethargy, you know, it's quite sluggish. Sleeps frequently, but beacons to voice or gentle shaking gentle okay gentle don't overshake the patient because if there's the pa- if the patient has a head trauma maybe you'll worsen things out later makoma so uh <laughs> they also include you you in college so you're always yeah, just like what i told you, you know i always feel sleepy during my college years i'm not sure if you're sleepy during the time watching my video when i try watching my video i really feel sleepy because of my i find my my lectures to be boring or maybe because i know this from the very start (laughs) so anyway uh obton dead extreme drowsiness minimal response minimally responsive barely follows commands requires vigorous stimulation as we mentioned not to awaken and stays awake for mere minutes Actually, this one is more on the, it's a funny part, but the other things that I've shared is from other textbook as well uh, and other sources. So when we say stupor, I think the one placed on the, uh, the, the picture, the example for stupor, I think that's a tampon, no? I'm not sure. I, I think so. But anyway, for stupor, minimal movement responds with groans and moans, as I mentioned earlier, and awakes. Awakens briefly only with repeat, repeated stimulation. Usually, uh, they made an example. You pass out drunk in college. I never drunk. Uh, I never drink any alcoholic beverages, so I don't. Mm, I haven't experienced this. <laughs> For coma, they place a vegetable. Does not respond to verbal stim. I think it should be stimuli. No, does not speak. The decorticate and the cerebrate no response to the brain. I didn't include the decorticate and the cerebrate. I was planning to, but I think it's too much for you to learn for this level. So maybe we'll you can search about that. A uh, nice to know. Uh, we're already done with that. So that's all about the uh the different levels of consciousness. So to continue, the thalamus have different major group of nuclei. Okay, uh, this is quite boring part, but I made it easier for you. you. You need to know about the inputs and the outputs, meaning input is nerve impulses that travels from outside going to the thalamus, and output is from the thalamus going outside, wherever it is, in the limbic system or so. So, the first one. The anterior nucleus actually receives input from the hypothalamus and sends output to the limbic system and its function is actually more on the emotional uh, that's the anterior no as i mentioned no uh, there's also another half it's for the other view but i didn't include it so that uh it's quite confusing no just focus on this i'll just tell you now it's on the other part later so the main function is for emotions and memory so that's fine for the next one the medial nuclei so it's more uh, it receives inputs from the limbic system and basal nuclei and sends output and send output to the cerebral cortex. The function is more on the emotions, learning, memory and cognition. So this is the thinking and knowing part, the medial. This is for the thalamus as well. But the main thinking and learning will be later. You'll know that more. So the next one, the number three, the nuclei in the lateral group. Actually, there's, I think, three. It receives input from the limbic system, superior uh, colliculi, and cerebral cortex, and send output to the cerebral cortex. So 
the lateral dorsal nucleus and same as with uh, anyway it functions as the expression the expression of emotions then the lateral posterior nucleus and the pulv pulvinar nucleus help in the integrate to integrate helps in the integration of sensory information for number four the ventral anterior nucleus and the ventral the, the number f i i mean yeah under the ventral the number four the ventral again the anterior nucleus and the ventral lateral nucleus receive input from the basal nuclei and sends output to the motor area of the cerebral cortex I know it's very complicated if you won't remember the basal nuclei and where is the cerebral cortex but later as you review this you'll find it easier I, I hope this actually this too is it plays a role in movement control okay so then the ventral posterior nucleus relays impulses from somatic sensations such as touch, pressure, tickles, vibration, um, pain, temperature, itch, and proprioception from the face to the body to the cerebral cortex. Okay? The lateral geniculate nucleus relays information these are still under the ventral group okay just so you know uh, the, again the lateral geniculate nucleus relays visual impulses to foresight from the retina to the primary visual area of the cerebral cortex later we'll also discuss about that and then the medial geniculate nucleus which actually relays auditory impulses for hearing from the ear to the primary auditory obviously no hearing auditory area of the cerebral cortex and then uh, the number five is the intralaminar nucleus, which is actually not in that part. It's on the uh, other picture. I think it's the medial view. So th they function in arousal and integration of sensory and motor information. Then number six, the midline nucleus. Uh, they actually function. They has a presumed function in memory and olfaction. Then the reticular nucleus, these are actually parts of, it monitors, filters, and integrates the activity of the other thalamic nuclei. So the bodyguard, the reticular nucleus. I remember the quiz when we had, I, I, write, I, I, was, I, I was right during that time, uh, the quiz when we had during the first year. <laughs> That's one of the questions. So anyway, now let's move on to the hypothalamus this is the hypothalamus it is a small part of the diencephalon located inferior to the thalamus and it is composed of four major regions so i will not talk about much about the four regions but just to run through to enumerate uh, the mammillary region the tuber tuberal region the one with the blue actually there's a key that the legend no, on the lower left part the supraoptic region and the preoptic region, the one purple or violet. I don't know the difference between the two colors, but I hope you know what I mean. So there are important functions of the hypo hypothalamus, in, including first the control of the autonomic nervous system. Remember, we discussed about that during the part one. So it regulates the contraction of smooth muscles and cardiac muscles and the secretion of many glands. I uh, remember the parts, the two types of, of autonomic nervous system. There is what we call the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So uh, the one on the, the quote unquote, maybe I was not able to, write, to pronounce it well. For the sympathetic, just a review, it's the fight or flight response. Then the other hand, for the parasympathetic, it's the rest and digest response. So these are examples and the different actions. So in correlation with that, it's actually the hypothalamus, which is somehow responsible for such uh, system or part of the nervous system or action. 
Now, the, uh, the letter B. Also, the hypothalamus is responsible for the production of hormones, specifically the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone. Nice to know. I, have sh I placed the picture, no? Oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus and is secreted into the bloodstream by the posterior pituitary gland. So, it's not really the posterior pituitary gland. There is there are two types, no? Anterior and posterior pituitary gland. So, let's just focus first on the posterior. Later, we'll talk about the, the other, the anterior during the endocrine system, I think, I hope. But anyway, so it's again oxytocin produced in the hypothalamus, then secreted in the bloodstream via the pituitary posterior pituitary gland. I highlighted the posterior because anterior has different hormones and endocrine functions. Okay, the oxytocin is a hormone and a neurotransmitter that is involved in the childbirth. It actually is responsible for the dilatation of the cervix and contraction in some point no and breastfeeding for the ejection of breast milk now that's important uh, do you know that simply by simply stimulating your nipple it could actually increase the level but not to that pathologic level no it increase the level of oxytocin so but it's not always applicable no if you're not pregnant why would you stimulate the nipple it's a different maybe there is still oxytocin but there's no milk Ex don't expect a milk going out maybe if you have milk even if you're not even pregnant y you need to have consultations it could be cancer <laughs> but anyway, so let's move forward so also in other sources they said it also associates, but this is not for our textbook, no? For other sources, they actually said that this oxytocin is associated with empathy, with trust, with sexual activities, and relationship building. So, I just imagine maybe this is the reason why we love someone who stimulates the nipple. No? I don't know. Uh, it's not really, it's not really uh, a part, no? It's just my analogy. I'm not really sure with that. So, also... This is in an, in other also some other textbook no in other sources, but not that credible. But in our in our source, there's no such uh, elaboration with this hormone. But they said, I'm not sure. I didn't completely read the entire book yet. No, but before I tried reading it, I can't remember. I, I tried finish. I I actually finished reading the entire textbook that we're using right now. But uh, I can't remember this part, or maybe I was reading so fast no, uh, because it's very thick. But anyway, this hormone, the oxytocin hormone, is also what we call love hormone, L-O-V-E, love hormone, because the levels of oxytocin increase during hugging and orgasm. Now, so, I, I don't know why would you check your hormones while having something, no, like being intimate with your partner or so. Uh, I don't know, like, they had studies with that. Uh, also, Another hormone is the antidiuretic hormone. When we say diuretic, it's more on the excretion of uh, urination. No, it's more on the urination. Uh, nice to know. It's also not in our in our book. The if ever you have problems like tumor or some issues with the brain, na there is a decreased level of production of the antidiuretic hormone. That's when you will have what we call the problem na diabetes insipidus. Oh, there, I know diabetes for you is sugar alone, but if you have diabetes insipidus, you keep on urinating, urinating, and urinating. So you keep on drinking water and so on. But there's a criteria for us to diagnose, no? If, But normally, if you drink water, obviously you urinate. So don't expect na, don't, don't be so paranoid na, oh, maybe, maybe I have diabetes insipidus. No, it's not really... Uh, like that. Now, you cannot diagnose. Don't diagnose yourself, especially if you have no criteria or you're not following. You didn't have any checkup. No? So, try to consult your doctor, the one that you trust. Anyway, that's just a nice to know or maybe I'll just, as you notice, no, some nice to knows are actually included in your exam. <laughs> so, wala lang for me to know if you're really listening or, or if you really watch the video. So, another thing. So, the hypothalamus also helps in the regulation of emotional and behavioral patterns. So, it 
is somehow involved in the expression of rage, anger, uh, aggression. Actually, there's no anger, but I think it's part of the anger. Pain, pleasure, and sexual arousal. Now, I placed the picture. No brain, no pain. The one, the yellow one. I, I forgot the title of this cartoon, but I was. it was supposed to... It, it is supposed to... Uh, how do you call that? Represent the the sexual arousal or pleasure but it seems like it's representing the pain part uh, anyway the other one is my pleasure so anyway, that's a thing just for you to remember maybe some something like this could help some to remember this part another it helps in the regulation of eating and drinking so if you have problems with eating and drinking, if you eat too much, maybe this part is the one with problem. Actually, there's a longer discussion about it, but uh, we won't be discussing that regarding the satiety or so. Okay, we won't discuss, discuss it for now. So again, it contains a feeding center, the one that is responsible for promoting eating, and a satiety center, which is which causes the sensation of fullness and and cessation of eating but some still eats despite of others no mo eat hapon despite of their full <laughs> and then also it contains a thirst center it's very self explanatory so i won't very dwell too much also it controls body temperature if the environment i uh, if you you are very hot or very cold actually i discuss about this during the homeostasis no so we don't need to dwell too much about this. Uh, for your question, Lano, the the one on the right side of the picture is a, I think that's a TV that could detect temperature. Supposedly, I was to um, say it's like that. Yeah, just for you to know, just to correlate. <laughs> also, it the hypothalamus is also responsible for the regulation of the circadian rhythm and states of consciousness. So in front of you is a picture of the circadian rhythm for some, no? So the the one I place is the supra the supras suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. It actually serves as the body's internal biological clock because of it's the main part which is responsible for the circadian rhythm or the daily rhythm. So now let's move on to the epithalamus. I'll be very brief down with this. No, the epithalamus is a small region superior and posterior to the thalamus and consists of the pineal gland and the habinic hab habinular. I, I I'm really having some issue with pronunciation. Habinular nuclei. Just check the one placed on the book on how it is very I pronounce well because I really make some errors. I'm remembering how to pronounce this forgive me for the background there might be some noise because currently it's raining so i hope it's not really that clear uh, but uh, i mean the noise no but i hope my voice is still clear despite of it's raining outside so the first one is the pineal gland it is a part of the endocrine system because it secretes the hormone melatonin so melatonin is known to be a part of the uh, it's actually a hormone responsible for the sleeping uh in induction no? in, it induces sleep because they notice that during bedtime it's elevated or if we, if the person is sleepy or if the person drinks melatonin the person tends to become sleepy okay and then also the habinular nuclei are involved in the olfaction especially in the emotional response or responses to odor such as if you love the cologne or so somehow in it it gives us this is the one responsible for such uh, nice to know sometimes no if later you'll see the different connection of this uh, part of the brain that's why it's connected with the emotions feelings and so Later, we'll correlate that. Now, let's talk about... I changed the background because the background is very boring. But still, the same background on the, behind it. Let's talk about the 
Cerebrum. The cerebrum is the the seat of intelligence, as they quote unquote. No, it provides us with the ability to read, write, speak, and to think, and to make conclusions, calculations, compose music, and all other cognitive processes and talents that we have and we share to other people. So, the cerebellum consists of an outer cerebral cortex, an in internal region of the cerebral white matter and the gray matter nuclei deep within the white matter so it's actually labeled okay i hope you you get that so the cerebral cortex is a region of gray matter that uh, forms the outer rim of the cerebrum so there is what we call the fold wait lang ha the that one, the gyrus, or in plural, gyri, this is the folds or the convolutions. Then the deep groups between folds are known as the fissure or fissures in plural. Then remember, we keep on talking about fissures earlier and groups, but <laughs> this is the time that we define them one by one. So that's why I told you na you'll learn and understand it better as we finish the study. You just keep on, you just read it again or you watch the video again. Then you'll have better perception. No? Para, para at least my YouTube uh, channel will have another view. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> anyway, so the shallower groups between the folds are termed or called sulcus or for plural, it's sulci. And the most prominent features, uh, actually, later, of the, the late, as you, you notice, no, the one, the most prominent features, the longitudinal features, separates the cerebrum into right and left hemisphere. So the one with the red mark is the, wait lang, it's the left hemisphere. And then the one on the right is actually the right hemisphere. This hem hemisphere are connected internally in the center by the corpus callosum. So I was not able to place a picture, but I you check it online. No? Corpus callosum or callosum, it's double L. So there are different lobes of the brain. I will not dwell too much about the information about it because it's more on the laboratory part. But you can read it still in our PDF, no? So we have the frontal lobe. Uh, actually, these these lobes are named after somehow in correlation or in connection with the bones of the skull. So the frontal lobe, then the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and uh, notice the the one on the center is the longitudinal fissure. Okay, it's a deep one. Then also the central sulcus. Take note, the central sulcus is the mark where you, sh you should, you should um, highlight because in front of it, the anterior, take note of the labels, okay, anterior and posterior. The in front, uh, please locate the central sulcus using your eyes. So in front of it is the pre-central gyrus. At the back is the post-central gyrus. And you'll know why I highlighted this later as we mentioned the different functions. Okay? Just take note of that. Or remember. So on the lateral, right lateral view, you can see, again, it's labeled the occipital lobe, then the temporal lobe, the purple one, the purplish one, then the, uh, what else, Baba? I also already, we already located the frontal lobe, right? So that's the main lo lobe. So there are important sensory areas that we need to know about the sensory, no? Remember, sensory, more on sensation. The first one is the primary soma somatosensory area, which is the one labeled no in front of you the one the areas one two and three it is located directly posterior sorry i want to cough but i can't pause or stop 
it is located directly posterior to the central sulcus of each cerebral hemisphere. So m meaning there's another part, okay, on the the left part. This where the one we are viewing right now is the right cerebral hemisphere. So it's also the same thing on the left, okay. So uh, it's on the parietal lobe. It this one, two, and three areas one, two, and three again named as the primary somatosensory area. So meaning there's a secondary, but I will not talk about that because I, I this is enough for you. No, we need to know the basics. Then later you can read more, or maybe during the time that you have uh, during your higher level, we may include that. You can also study that for future use, but. Uh, for me, for now, I don't want to make your life very complicated, especially because there are limited time, no? So, these areas 1, 2, and 3 receives nerve impulses to touch, pressure, vibration, each tickle temperature, uh, like for example, coldness or warmth, pain and proprioception, we defined that earlier regarding the position of the uh, body, no? And is involved in the perception of the somatic sensation somatic remember the term somatic it's more on the muscular or the uh yeah the muscular or the uh, musculoskeletal part the sensation okay i hope that's clear that's one two and three primary sen somatosensory area the second one the one i mark is the primary visual area area 17 is located at the posterior tip of the occipital lobe, mainly on the medial surface. That's why if ever that you want to, if you hit someone, no, because you really hate him or her, and you hit someone on the back, they if you hit this area, if there's a bleeding or fracture or trauma to this area, the person could become blind, okay? Uh, sometimes if I watch teleseries, no, or series, series, sorry, and and uh, if ever there are some episodes that they hit the back and then they become blind, uh, somehow I try to correlate. Ah, yeah, because they hit the the primary visual area, which actually is area seventeen. <laughs> well, actually, I can't remember that it's area seventeen, but I know it's the primary visual area, the part of the occipital area. No, so anyway, nice to know. Uh, it's actually not a nice to know. It's a very need to know, but at least you can remember this. No, you can apply anatomy and physiology in all things. No, except sa animals. I know you're a biologist. No, so I don't know if the brain of the dog and cats and cockroaches are same with the humans. You can give me a feedback. Place it under the comment. I don't know if you can comment on my YouTube. Uh, that's how I notice some bloggers. Uh, do such you no know, to the more you make a comment the more it goes up i'm not really sure how it works but anyway moving forward the areas 41 and 42 are actually what we call the primary auditory area it is located in the superior part of the temporal lobe if you notice so the e, e, the the temporal lobe will only will end up to the lateral Cerebral sulcus, okay? Just take note of that for your laboratory part. And then uh, it receives information for sound and is involved in auditory uh, perception. It's easier to remember because it's in that part where the ears is actually, the ear or the ears, our ears are located, okay? And then the next one, the Area 43, the primary gustatory area located at the base of the post-central post gyrus superior to the lateral cerebral sulcus in the parietal cortex. It receives impulses for, obviously, for gustatory. Gustatory is more on the taste, no? And it involves in the gustatory perception and taste discrimination. Remember that it. if you tried locating, they are... In the same area with the 1, 2, and 3. And what is areas 1, 2, and 3 for? It's more on the perception. That's why if you notice, if you eat, no, if for taste something, somehow your mind change. No? If, if, for example, you're having a bad day and then uh, someone gave you something, not roses, huh? you don't eat roses unless if you're, you're that hungry. If ever you eat 
And then your mood changes, your perception to life becomes better. Or, okay, I want to leave again. Uh, somehow because they're connected. Uh, they're not directly connected, but so, this, this connection will somehow influence the other part. Uh, you'll learn that soon. You're, you'll correlate. Somehow this, some of the explanation that I shared are actually not from the textbook. But this is true. Okay. <laughs> anyway, moving forward. Where am I? Uh, the part, the primary olfactory area, which is actually the area 28, is not actually indicated or shown there. But it is located in a temporal lobe on the medial aspect. Uh, so it's not, it's not seen there. It receives the impulses for smell and is involved in the olfactory receptor i uh, perception sorry so that's why it's actually connected as well with the with the um perception also with the memory somehow okay uh, we can correlate that if we have enough time so that's for the the previous ones are for sensory have you noticed something most of the sensory part is before the central sulcus that I mentioned. So, before the central sulcus, posterior part, is more on the sensory. Now, the one after, I mean, that's before, no? I mean, uh, on the posterior part, uh, just try to locate the central sulcus because it's termed different way, no? Central sulcus, you notice, the one at the back, should I say, on the posterior part, on the posterior part of the central sulcus are more on the sensory. Now, in front, on the anterior part of the, the central sulcus, it's more on the motor. So let's talk about the area four. It's what we term primary motor area. So it is located in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe, and it is more responsible on the different muscles and my battery is low but my laptop is low but sige lang, I'll talk faster uh, and represented unequally in the primary motor also another the motor area under motor area is the Broca's speech area which is area 44 and 45 it is located in the frontal lobe close to the lateral cerebral sulcus and is more on the speaking and understanding language. There are some disorders regarding such. Even alcoholism could affect this area. That's why, uh, as we talk, no, if for example you're drunk or intoxicated, you your speech is not so good. They talk like that. Or maybe if you're, uh, you can also your understanding is also not that that good. So because this part is highly affected with intoxication. Also for patients who have uh, lesions in this area, when you say lesions like mass or maybe like a stroke in this area, no, na bawasan na, the circulating blood is impeded because of the cholesterol or something else, and this part is also affected, somehow the speech and understanding are also involved. So uh, I this is the last slide that, of, of this lecture and I mentioned earlier about the homunculus no the different homunculus oh no I didn't mention that but it was mentioned earlier that the different motors are actually represented no by in the precentral uh precentral region remember this wait lang ha I'll go back ah, here na lang because it will take some time the central sulcus the the precentral gyrus, please check the one with the primary motor area, and the primary somatosensory area, the one with the label close and open and close parenthesis post central gyrus. This is its representation. No, so the one on the motor cortex, the one labeled motor cortex, is the. It represents the motor, the pre. Uh, I'll go back for you to really recall the precentral gyrus okay then the one with the label somatosensory cortex is the postcentral gyrus okay so meaning uh, the video or uh, the picture 
the different picture the different parts of the it's cut no in in a lateral uh, in a way that you could comprehend no it's more unresponsible that, those parts are responsible for such part of our body on the left side naman it's more on the sensation so that's why you can check this out later no if that specific the reason for for this is if for example this specific part of the brain is affected or being uh, is because hit by something or trauma or so no uh these parts of our body will also be affected we may have problems with a sensation if the post central gyrus is the one with the said lesion or trauma or cancer or so or if there are even genitals no if you notice and also if the sensation uh if if the the pre-central gyrus is the one affected so more on the movement and motor but if both you may have motor problems and sensation problems and also remember that if for example the left hemisphere is affected it's more on the right and then the right hemisphere is affected more on the left part of our body but there are some exclusion criteria uh, exclusion exclusion of the said rule no but soon we'll talk about that okay uh, my laptop is low but na so that ends actually that's also the end of our lecture so i hope you had you learned a lot and tell me if you want to have the quiz after this lecture or it's okay for you to combine two lectures the next topic will be the endocrine system uh, endocrine yeah i think so endocrine system the one i sent for uh, the pdf okay so if you have questions please inform me and if you have even if it's not really directly correlated with our topic uh, i will be very happy to answer it actually i want to know each and every one of you and unfortunately no we, we can't even see each other maybe if we if you see me somewhere you're not even sure if it's me because i look different in real life i'm not really good looking <laughs> i don't really like myself but an like self pity you know but i may also not recognize you because maybe both of us are wearing masks and face shields so <laughs> we're not sure if in some point we've been together in a grocery store basing kaaway pataka before but anyway see lang uh, we just hope that everything will be okay with the uh, with our our situation right now and while this pandemic is happening please take advantage of it try to learn everything don't surrender continue your guitar and be be healthy uh, okay so that's all thank you have a nice day